If you've uh, ever been really hurt by a lie, then you know how really devastating and painful it can be. Our uh, society is becoming increasingly dishonest. A lot of this has to do with just sort of the postmodern mindset that has crept in over the last several decades, a mindset that values perception uh, more than reality. Um, but deception is nothing new. I mean, uh, sin entered the world through a lie. Um, and uh, so it just seems like it's getting worse and worse. But it shouldn't come as a surprise. Paul, in the New Testament, predicted that deception would get worse and worse. And uh, I, I came across the striking words here of Jeremiah the prophet, which was about 600 years before Christ, when he said, and see if you don't think this is just as apropos today, he said uh, from Jeremiah chapter 9, Beware of your friends, do not trust your brothers. For every brother is a deceiver and every friend a slanderer. Friend deceives friend, and no one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongues to lie. They weary themselves with sinning. You live in the midst of deception. In their deceit, they refuse to acknowledge me, declares the Lord. Now that sounds kind of harsh, and it is kind of heavy when we think about the devastating consequences of lies and deceit. Um, so I thought I'd start out on a light note. You know, speaking of deception and cheating, and evil. Uh, we do have the Super Bowl today. And uh, I caught this, uh, I screenshot this from ESPN the other day. They were covering all the hype about the Super Bowl, and they were sort of talking about what was going on at the Rams uh, practice facility. And here's what they saw. So I thought that was... Uh... Now those of you that don't follow football, that's uh, Belichick, the coach of the Patriots. So, uh, but uh, I want us to look at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, when Jesus preached the Sermon on the Mount, he recognized that these first century Jews that he was speaking to were looking at Matthew's record of that message. But remember, it was a verbal sermon that he gave on the side of a hill. That's why they call it the Sermon on the Mount. And it was the first major sermon that he preached early on in his ministry. Remember, uh, if you think about the life of Christ, he was, of course, born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, grew up in the home of Joseph and Mary, and didn't begin his earthly uh, ministry until about the age of 33. And, um, and he ministered, according to the biblical record, for about three and a half years until he was crucified at the age of 37. So when we talk about the life of Christ, we're really looking at just a small three to four year window of his activities and just a selected amount of those activities at that. And Matthew records the largest, uh, more detailed amount about this sermon that took place on the hillside that day. And these Jews, like people of all eras, were struggling with the concept of truthfulness in their speech. Again, this is nothing new. And they were prone to dishonesty. And so because of this, the Jewish leaders of the day had the scribes, the Pharisees, they had redefined the law so that in their dishonesty, they wouldn't be breaking the law. Remember, by this time in, in Jewish history, the law had, had sort of become everything. They had, they had become law worshipers. They had forgot the whole point of the law being given, uh, you know, centuries earlier, millennia earlier, with Moses on Mount Sinai, 1,400 years before Christ. Uh, the whole point of the law had been to help drive people to, to Yahweh, to the God of the, of the universe, the creator of the universe. But they had elevated the law to the supreme essence. And so as long as they could lie without breaking the law, then they felt like they were okay. They were, they were all about the letter of the law, but had no concern with the intent of the law. So in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 33, Jesus sets out to clarify the intent of the law, as He does throughout the whole Sermon on the Mount, but specifically as it relates to speech and being honest in what you say. So let's take a look at some uh, some background, as I mentioned, this took place early on in Christ's ministry, around 30 uh, to 31 A.D. It's part of the Sermon on the Mount. 
And Jesus is addressing a false view of the law. If you remember, uh, and we, we taught through, uh, we studied the Sermon on the Mount early on when I had first come to North Route, but I know that's been a while. Um, but if you remember, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus repeatedly says, you have heard that it was said such and such, but I tell you this. You, know, you have heard that it was said, don't murder, but I tell you, if you hate, you've already murdered. You've heard that it was said, don't commit adultery, but I tell you, if you lust, you're already in trouble. That it's not what you do that matters, it's what's in the heart. And it was a whole uh, teaching about self-righteousness versus faith-righteousness. These people were prideful and, and thought that they could, as long as they could check off a list of you know, do's and don'ts, and as long as they could dot their I's and cross their T's, they could pat themselves on the back for being law keepers, but their hearts were far from God. So Jesus says, if I could sort of summarize the Sermon on the Mount, that the heart of the matter is the heart. And so let's take a look with that background on the Sermon on the Mount at these few verses, and then we'll come back and, uh, and, and give you a little bit more context about what exactly he means by these words. It starts out with him saying, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, or the way he would have probably enunciated it was, but I say to you, you have heard this is what the old law people said and the way they interpreted it. I, the Son of God, am telling you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you swear by your head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. Let your yes be yes, and your no, no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. So, as time wore on, oaths became very, very common in the first century. There were all kinds of oaths. They were used to affirm their truthfulness. It's kind of like kids when they're saying some outlandish thing. They'll say, you know, I pinky swear, or I swear on my mother's grave, or I swear on this, or this, or, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and, and the Jews were no different in that day. They had all kinds of different ways to try to affirm the truthfulness of what they were saying. And oaths became a part of every day commerce. They were used to settle disputes. You could go before a court and you could say, well, he used this oath and then this one and then he backed it up with this oath and therefore he must be accountable for this. And then this person would say, no, but he didn't do this oath quite right and so I'm off the hook. And it was, it was all about uh, the oaths. The, the rabbis were manipulating the laws so that some oaths were binding and some were not. Uh, so, for instance, as we read Jesus talking about here, swearing by heaven and earth was not binding. It was a non-binding oath. It was sort of meaningless. Really, it, it imp indicated a little bit more intensity and, 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 and importance, but it wasn't binding. Uh, neither was swearing by Jerusalem, but swearing toward Jerusalem was binding. Do you see how they were splitting hairs and trying to get around the law. And of course, swearing in the name of Yahweh was the most binding oath of all, but it was rarely done because they, uh, as you know, they, the Jews revered the name Yahweh. They wouldn't even vocalize it. So they hardly ever would swear uh, in His uh, name. So Jesus comes along then and, and He says, look, don't swear at all, essentially. Uh, now, through the years, you know, fast forward now to our day, modern day, a lot of groups have misunderstood uh, Jesus' words here, meaning you should never take an oath of any kind. The Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, uh, took the, that this way. But to do that is to completely miss the point of Jesus' teaching, not only in this passage, but the whole Sermon on the Mount. It would be tantamount to thinking that you should literally gouge out your eye if someone offends you, or if your eye offends you. It's a, it's a metaphor, it's a, an illustration, and Jesus was essentially saying you need to get past all the technicalities and just be honest. He wasn't forbidding the taking of oaths universally. In fact, he himself took an oath three and a half years later before the Sanhedrin. Jesus was not forbidding the taking of all oaths. He was forbidding the, taking and ma the making and taking of oaths in order to validate speech. 
He says it should be unnecessary. Your words should be enough. You should be honest. If you can't be honest in your speech, you shouldn't swear at all. Uh, Jesus was demanding that our speech be so trustworthy that no one would have to debate before a court of law or anywhere else the meaning of the, the words or some hidden deceptive intent. Between brothers, especially, Jesus says, a simple yes or no should suffice. So Christ in this, these five verses is arguing for the integrity of all words, sworn and unsworn. Looks sounds like we're getting another one of those spring showers. I'm not sure what that's about. So what I want to address this morning is this. Does your speech honor the Lord? Jesus isn't talking here about oaths or not oaths. He's, he's talking about trustworthiness in speech. We seem like the Pharisees in the first century to have found lots of different ways to lie without lying, if that's even possible. We, we like to differentiate between so-called little white lies and the big whoppers, for example. We've convinced ourselves maybe that withholding part of the truth or twisting the truth or exaggerating the truth, and we're going to talk about all of this, is not a lie. But is that really the case? And so I want to give you four questions that we can ask ourselves just to see if our speech honors the Lord. But first, we have to start with a good, clear definition of lying. All right? So what is a lie? This is important, and, and we don't have time to dive into this at length as we would, say, in a classroom setting where we're really debating this philosophically. Just, you know, we're going to try to cut to the heart of the matter in, in Scripture, and we can, you can kind of study it on your own. But what is a lie? Uh, was it, did, did the whole church lie to me last March when they threw me a surprise 50th birthday party? Was that a lie? Were they sinning before a holy God? Was Wendy a despicable sinner... <laughs> because she c conspired to deceive me into going to someone's house to play dominoes when she knew in her heart she was not going to play dominoes. Was that a lie? Today in the big game, when the quarterback tries to fake the snap count and deceive the opponents into jumping across the line, is he lying? Is he committing an immoral act? Is he sinning against a holy God? What about, for that matter, the playbooks? No, no, the Cowboys, they have, a, they have a carte blanche, get out of jail free card, which given the history of the Cowboys probably wouldn't be a bad idea. But anyway, um, matter of fact, before the game, if, if this is considered a lie, then, then uh, the two coaches, Belichick and who's the Rams coach, Andrew, do you remember? Uh, Sean, oh, yeah, Sean McVay, that 30, what, three-year-old guy. Unbelievable. Um, they should get together and swap playbooks. They don't want to deceive each other. They would be sinning against a holy God, right? Uh, what about uh, in a game of cards? If you bluff, is that a sin, Phil? If you are deceptive and you say, you know, I, I'm going to raise you or something because I've got a great hand when really you're sitting there with a two, seven, six, and four non-suited or something, right? I mean, let's, let's go on. What about in, in national defense? Should we call up the, the, the leader of North Korea and say, we just want to let you know, here's where our submarines are, and here's where our battleships are, and here's our plan, and is that a lie? Anybody hiding any Jews from the Nazis? Were you sinning against a holy God when you did that? Now let's get less heavy. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, thank you, Phil. Thank you. I, I, uh, I appreciate that. Uh, do you like my picture, Daddy? Okay, what, what if you're playing a game of hide-and-seek? Are you deceiving? Are you sinning against a holy God because you deceived the people in the game? What about a magic show? I met with a lot of interacted with a lot or a few Christian magicians through the years in different conferences and they're clearly deceiving the audience. Some of it really blows me away. The answer is no. So here's my definition of lying. 
that I think corresponds to Jesus' teaching that it's about the heart attitude, not the act itself. Lying is intentional deceit with a sinful purpose or motive. Remember, sin always originates in the heart. It's not the act itself that's sin. It's the motive of the heart. Is it a sin to take someone's life? Murder? Yes. Self-defense? No. Scripture's clear on that. Both are the same act. One's a sin, one's not. Is it a sin to have intimate relations with someone? Adultery? Yes. In a married relationship? No. Same act, different circumstance, different heart attitude. Uh, Is it a sin to take money from a bank? No, if you have an account there and you're withdrawing money. Yes, if you're wearing a mask and holding a gun. Same act. So just simply saying something that you know not to be true is not a lie. I just gave you several examples of that. Unless it's intentional and it's got a sinful purpose behind it. That's what the Bible calls lying. So, Does your speech honor the Lord? Uh, Let's talk first of all about this question. Do I magnify the truth? Do I magnify the truth? Exaggeration is common. We all do it from time to time. Some people do it more than others. And and honestly, preachers can be the worst, right? Uh, And when you're exaggerating the truth for some sinful purpose, your own pride, to make yourself look better, to accomplish some nefarious means, when you're magnifying the truth, That's a sin. That's not honoring the Lord with your speech. Little eight-year-old Maggie got a St. Bernard for her birthday, but she told all her friends at school that she'd been given a lion. And when her mother found out, she told Maggie to go to her room and tell God she was sorry for lying. And when she came out, Mom asked, well, did you tell God you were sorry? And Maggie said, yes, I did. And mom said, what did God say? She said, well, God said that sometimes he confuses my dog for a lion too. So, <laughs> exaggeration. Sometimes it's innocent enough, no sinful or nefarious uh, motive, but sometimes it's deceitful with a selfish, sinful motive. Proverbs 25 says, whoever falsely boasts Whoever falsely boasts of giving is like clouds and wind without rain. That word boast is the Hebrew word hallel. That's where we get hallelujah. <laughs> means to praise. So whoever praises himself is the idea. Falsely, the word falsely is the Hebrew word shakir. Not shakil, that's his brother. Plays, but shakir, shakir, it, it means to be excessively wrong. So what he's saying here is whoever exaggerates and brags and praises himself falsely is like clouds and wind without rain. That's a pretty pretty interesting illustration when you think about it. We've all experienced those times when, especially in the mountains, we see these dark, ominous storm clouds on the horizon, and we just know that a fierce storm is coming. We expect torrential rain or wind or hail. A few minutes later, those clouds clouds sort of drift away and sometimes not a drop of rain falls or maybe only a light rain. You might say the clouds exaggerated the intensity of the storm. And and when we magnify the truth, that's, that's what we're doing. Proverbs 20 says, Most men will proclaim each his own goodness. Proclaim there means shout out. But who can find a faithful man? Someone who's purely honest, no exaggeration. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. The second question is, do I misrepresent the truth? To misrepresent is to willfully mislead, to sort of twist it just enough that though there may be a grain of truth in it, it's understood something to be something that it's not. It's kind of a a form of covert deception. What are your motives? Are you feeling tempted to misrepresent the truth? Check your motives. Are your motives pure in what you're saying? 
Or is there some selfish or deceitful motive? The classic example of this comes from the New Testament church age and the story of Ananias and Sapphira. You remember that? A certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. They misrepresented the truth. They, they said, oh, we believe in this cause, this first century uh, Jerusalem church, and we're behind you 100%. We're going to go sell this property and give you all the money. That's the way they represented it. But in reality, they kept part of it and let everybody believe they were more generous than they were. If you're insecure and trying to win approval, you're in danger of misrepresenting the truth. If you're manipulative and have some form of dishonest gain in mind, you might be in danger of misrepresenting the truth. But do I misrepresent the truth? Do I exaggerate it? And then there's do I mask the truth? To mask the truth is to leave out or withhold pertinent facts, willingly presenting incomplete information for nefarious reasons. We often call this not telling the whole truth. We might say, I told the truth, just not all of it, right? Reminds me of the farmer that bought a horse and he was told honestly by the farmer who, I mean the seller who sold the farmer this horse, that there's one thing wrong with this horse that you need to be aware of. And the farmer said, well, what's that? And the seller said, this horse likes to sit on avocados. The farmer said, well, that's kind of weird, but I don't really have any avocados on my farm. Shouldn't be a problem. So he bought the horse, and on the way home, the farmer had to cross a stream, and right in the middle of the stream, the horse sat down and wouldn't budge. And the farmer kicked him, prodded him, goaded him, did, pulled him, everything he could, the horse wouldn't budge. So the farmer angrily walked back to the horse dealer where he bought the horse, and he angrily explained what had happened. What in the world's going on? The horse seller said, well... Now, you never asked me anything about it, so I, I, I didn't tell you. Didn't tell me what? Well, that old horse, if he can't find any avocados, he likes to sit on fish. So uh, that was the problem. In Psalm 15, this was our verse that we read today. This is King David writing, Lord, may, who may abide in your tabernacle? He who speaks the truth in his heart. See, to withhold information, to mask the truth is deceitful. It's deceitful. Back to Proverbs, he who walks with integrity. See, masking the truth is a matter of integrity. What's your motive? Is there pertinent information that the other person needs to know? Then tell them. You're not doing anybody any good by lying. This falls into that category of lying as I defined it. Isaiah the prophet reminds us of the blessings of honest speech when he says, He who walks righteously and speaks uprightly, he will dwell on high. Remember, in the ancient Near East, Israel and around, to be up high was considered a blessing. That was the best vantage point. It was where you could see the enemies coming and be secure. And, 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 and the prophet says that when you speak uprightly, that's your defense, that's your fortress. That's your sustenance. Be honest. And then finally, if the first three questions relate to sort of covert deception, then this last one deals with overt deception. We talked about exaggerating the truth or magnifying it, twisting it or misrepresenting it, uh, not telling the whole truth, masking some of it. But here we're dealing with an outright lie. You know, any one of these examples would be dishonest and sinful and wrong, but this last one is the most blatant. In this age of inception, it's, it, deception is getting easier and easier to pull off a blatant lie. In fact, Hitler said the greater the lie, the easier it is to be believed. Some people are better at it than others, but it's, you know... It still happens. And, and, and the Bible says that a, a false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies will not escape. It may be 
in the life to come, that you give account for all of that. Or more often than not, your lies catch up to you and it happens here. But a false witness will not go unpunished and he who speaks lies will not escape. This is one of the foundational Ten Commandments. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Remember, let's not be legalistic like the Pharisees were and say because you lied about a surprise party, you broke one of the Ten Commandments. It's to intentionally deceive with a sinful purpose in mind. Uh, that's the Ninth Commandment. Uh, in Proverbs lists seven things that God hates. And twice in that list of seven is lying. These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to Him. A lying tongue, a false witness who speaks lies. Uh, you don't think honesty in your speech is important to our Heavenly Father? When you get right down to it, it's, it's all we have. Our integrity, our reputation, who we are. Jesus in Matthew 12 talks about how over the, uh, uh, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, that the heart is what bubbles over and comes out the mouth. So it reflects who you are. Actions are important and can also be a blessing and reflect who you are, and we ought to do good things. The Bible's clear about that as well. But fundamentally, your speech is the essence of who you are. And if you can't be honest, that's a, prob that's a heart problem, not a speech problem. We should follow Christ's example. Peter said, For to you, to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Well, what was his example? He committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. When you think about summarizing the sinless Savior Jesus, it seems like a lot of things could have been mentioned if you're going to grammatically here say he committed no sin, and then the comma there is sort of a such as. He committed no sin, such as, you know, murdering somebody. He committed no sin, such as adultery. He committed no sin, such as, you know, kicking his dog or whatever. He, but what he says is he committed no sin, especially deceitfulness in his mouth. That's the key. That's the key. So here's the questions. How can you tell if your speech is marked by total and complete honesty and honors the Lord. Well, examine your heart. That's the key. These questions will sort of expose the motives of our heart. Paul told the Corinthians that one of the commendations of his ministry was truthful speech. I can just hear him saying that in 2 Corinthians 6. You know, I may not have been perfect, but I want you to know before God, I, I've done my best to be honest before you. Of all the people in the world, Christians should be trustworthy. How do you measure up? We were talking to Morgan, uh, I guess it was yesterday, about his first full week of school. He's back, you know, for his second semester at college. and just kind of asked him about some of his classes. And he's doing well, by the way. But he, uh, talking to him, it reminded me of a story about a professor, a trigonometry professor, Dr. Madison Serrett at Vanderbilt University. And for years, as he taught there, Every time he gave a test, before giving the test, he would admonish his class by saying something like this. Class, today I'm giving you two examinations. One in trigonometry, the other in honesty. I hope you pass them both. But if you must fail one, fail trigonometry. There are many good people in the world who cannot pass trig. But there are no good people in the world who cannot pass the test of honesty. So what's the takeaway then? Well, the takeaway is these four questions. And I hope we'll all sort of commit these to memory and just ask ourselves. We really don't even need these questions. We just need to ask ourselves, what's my heart saying? If I'm having some fun playing hide-and-seek or a card game, hey, that's fine. But if I'm intentionally trying to deceive someone for sinful purposes... That's a problem, and it's a serious problem because it reflects the heart. Let's pray. Father, we uh, come before you today confessing our lack of honesty at times as we deal with the flesh and deal with our own pride and 
insecurities and how often we are less than truthful in our speech. We confess that and seek forgiveness. And Father, we, uh, we thank you that because of you and your Son who provided a new and living way for us, we can find reconciliation and restoration the moment we confess. And we pray if there's one here within the sound of my voice today that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, that it would begin there with a new relationship, a new life, simply by saying, I'm a sinner who needs a Savior, and I know I can't save myself, so I'm asking Jesus, the one who took my place on the cross, died and rose again for my sin, to give me forgiveness and the gift of eternal life. And Father, for those who know the Lord, we pray that uh, you would help us to walk with integrity in what we say. And for those who may not be walking in integrity, we pray that conviction would overwhelm them and that they would come clean and make it right with those they are, they are wronging and most of all with you. And it's in the precious name of your Son and our Savior we pray. Amen.